tonight we're speaking about being intentional, what it means to be intentional in our service and in our pursuit of the Lord. Now I want us to start here, that what defines every relationship is not the length of the relationship. It's not how long you guys have been in a relationship or a friendship. That's not what defines a relationship. I would even argue that what defines a relationship, it's not the level of closeness that you have. It's not how often you communicate, how often you call each other, how often you are in each other's company. Although those are important elements in the making of a relationship, but I wouldn't necessarily say that's what defines a relationship. What tends to define a relationship is intention. I want you to hear me properly. What defines a relationship is intention. What each person has decided in their heart when it comes to the relationship. We, we are going to speak and touch on earthly principles before we engage in heavenly principles. You guys know this. I love saying this. And I think this is beautiful. This is important. Nkulungulu knows that because we are people that are confined in this flesh and confined in this world, at times things have to reveal, be revealed to us in an earthly perspective, in an earthly manner for us to fully digest them in a heavenly principle, in a heavenly manner. So I want us to speak and define a relationship from an everyday perspective and an everyday manner. My sister, what defines the relationship you have with the brother? It's not how much he says he loves you. It's not the good things he does for you. It's not how often he comes to see you. What properly defines your relationship is the intention he has concerning you. And if intentions have not been specified from the onset, then that relationship is not defined. If you have never fully understood or investigated or inquired of him, of the intention behind the relationship, then that relationship stand undefined. Because he can do all the nice things for you. He can come and see you. He can buy you good things. He can tell his friends and people around you that he cares and loves you. But before he gives a clear indication and description of this relationship until he defines his intention concerning this relationship. That relationship stands undefined. That's why some people, this guy has been dating me for five years and this guy has been dating me for seven years or eight years. But when I look at this guy, there are no intentions of him making me his wife or marrying me. Why? Because when the relationship commenced, intentions were not defined. What we thought defined the relationship was the honeymoon phase, was the goosebumps, was the closeness, how long you've known each other, the fact that both of you are serving in one church, the fact that both of you are serving in one ministry, the fact that both of you grew up together, but the intentions of why he's there in the first place were never defined. And as a result, you're wondering why you guys are in a, in a relationship for that long, but he has never told you that he sees you as being his potential wife. He sees you as being a mother of his kids. Why? Because intentions were not defined, even though closeness was realized. So this makes it plain for us to understand this important fact. Until intentions are clearly defined, a relationship cannot be defined. And what defines a relationship, it's not a public proclamation, but it's a private conviction. What defines a relationship is not a public proclamation, but it starts by private conversations. It's easy for him to say he loves you publicly, but how sure are you that he loves you if he has not confessed that privately? So relationships are defined in a private setting. Relationships are defined from a place of conviction. That's why some of us are obsessed about how certain people look on social media and, and how happy we can be on social media. Not necessarily knowing what in the private setting. Yes, in the public setting, they might be portraying a happy couple. In the public setting, they might be portraying a couple that has potential. But in the private space, they are distant and indifferent from each other. They are not walking in oneness. So, so, so a relationship is clearly defined in the private setting where serious conversations are had, where intentions are revealed. That's why even when the Bible speaks about us 
in our intention, in devotion, and in relationship with Christ. The Bible says, before you profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you must first believe with your heart. So from a place of private and secret conviction before it can come to a place of public proclamation. There must be a conversation you have with yourself in your heart before you can tell us and confess unto us your love for him. You must be sure that you love him in your heart first before you can tell us you love him in the public place. That's why the Bible says it's better that you seek him first in the private space. Because when you seek him in the private space, he has the power to reward you publicly. So public rewards start from private conversations. So when you be confident to go to brother, you have publicly if he has not told you go to your privately. You can't want to reveal his intentions to us if he has not revealed his intentions to you privately. Why? Because relationships are defined in a private setting. Relationships are defined from a place of conviction. That's why when people get married, we celebrate publicly what was agreed privately. Sister celebrated nabo, she said jabula nabo, but this agreement was done in our absence. The, the, the relationship was initiated in our absence. When we are celebrating with them publicly, we are just confirming what was initiated privately. Why? Because privately is where intentions are made plain. In the absence of people. So, Masbonu brother proposal. Or when we see the invitation being sent to us, these people had a conversation in our absence so that we can celebrate with them in our presence. So relationships are first defined in the private setting. And one thing we know about our relationship with God is that God's intentions concerning us are clear. That's the second thing. Intentions are communicated, but intentions are also made clear. In fact, the first thing I told my wife and I'm not saying I'm a standard, but the first thing I told my wife was that before, even before we dated, while we were still friends, I was hinting on this, and I was like, I want, you to, I want to marry you, I want you to be my wife. Why? Because the intention must be clear, even though we might date, but I see this going to a place of marriage, so that we don't waste each other's time here. You don't have to pick my brain. You don't have to guess, what, what, what am I thinking? The intention must be plain, what am I thinking? at some point in time and and when the intentions are defined the need for them to be clear is when we even give and communicate timelines in five years time god willingly in five years time i want to marry you so once intentions are made plain then in the communication of the intentions after they've been made plain we need to clarify certain things and uncle uncle when it came to us, he first revealed his intentions concerning men. And after he revealed his intentions concerning us, he made his intentions clear and plain. What were the intentions of God? That he will make us in his image. What were the intentions of God? That we are the apple of his eye. What are the intentions of God? That he first demonstrated his love in this. That while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. He made his intentions known. And after making his intentions known, he clarified and communicated his intentions. Through Christ, we shall be reconciled to him. So, Uncle Uncle, when it comes to us, his intentions are clear that he will pursue us because we are the apple of his eye. We are his beloved. Now, why is this important for us to fully understand? It's because even though we are in this relationship with the Father, we have entered in this covenant with Christ himself. We, we, we are the bride and he's the husband. The issue with us is that even though his intentions are plain, that he will preserve us, he will keep us, he, that he has saved us, he is saving us and he will save us. That greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Even though he constantly communicates his intentions and his promises concerning us, we have never done the same when it comes to our relationship with him. Our relationship with the Lord is undefined. That's why Abanye Betu, we, we are saved and it's all good. But we don't behave and walk as those who are in a relationship. A relationship that has clear intentions. That even though he's playing his part, but Tina, we're not playing our part because even though the intentions were communicated, 
we never communicated our intentions in this relationship. We, we just took him as Lord and Savior for the sake of preservation and for the sake of being kept. But we have never communicated with him from now on going forward. Our lives will be fully subjected and surrendered to his will. That we did not forsake everything to follow him. That even though we are in this marriage, even though we are in this covenant, but we are still looking. Christ is convenient at a certain time when we have needs. But after our needs are met, we start looking. Why? Because even though he has communicated his intentions concerning this relationship, we have not done the same. Consider a husband and a wife that commit themselves to marriage. The moment both of them commit themselves to marriage, they are clearly communicating with you from now on, Angsa Begi, anywhere else in Begela. You are my portion in this life. My wife, you are my portion in this life. Husband, you are my portion in this life. But think about how painful it would be for this guy to surrender everything else and to commit himself in the relationship and to provide and to care and to be available and to protect and to serve and to lay his life. Kanti, the wife is not doing the same. Kanti, the wife embraces him in seasons where he's providing. The wife embraces him in seasons where he's a protector. But in between, the wife is looking. Even though she has committed in this relationship. Why? Because when she committed in this relationship, intentions were not communicated. And as a result, vows were said without properly reflecting on them. We love you, Lord, but actions were not aligned to our confessions. Even though we are in this relationship, but the reason why we are fluid, my relationship with God is fluid. The reason why we are fluid with the Lord is because we have not clearly communicated our intentions in this relationship. When he calls us to die to self, we say, no, 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 no. that's not what we signed up for. When he, when he calls us to deny ourselves, we say, ah, yeah, yeah, but when I manage, that's not what we signed up for. That's not why we accepted this call. That in this relationship, intentions are not defined. And I want us to, to speak on this. We're going to touch on a few scriptures. I want us to, to touch on this. This is a true story. It happened to a friend of mine. It's a very painful story. We're going to read First John 4, verse 19, Romans 5, verse 8. We touched on it. And then John 6, verse 44. And then we're also going to touch on 2 Corinthians 9, verse 5 to 7, Luke 14, verse 25 to verse 33. So we have scriptures that we're going to touch upon. And I'm changing Minga Manya because I was just feeling a bit tired. So please bear with me. I'm not, I'm not trying to be powerful. I, I just want to stand. I want us to talk. I'm I have this friend of mine and he dated this girl back in varsity. And they dated for about four years. They were in varsity. And this guy kept telling this girl, Both of them are believers. Because in especially with you sisters, I want us to talk. And brothers also. As believers, why do we enter into relationships if marriage is not the end goal? That's the first thing. Why do we bother entering into relationships if marriage is not the end goal? Because we, we have entered into this place where it's supposed to lead us to that. It's supposed to lead us to marriage. Because we are in this dating phase for long for the sake of why do we bother in the first place to enter into relationships if we are not ready to commit to marriage? Why? As believers. Now, they have their own standards. But for us who are called of the Lord, why do we bother? enter into relationships, play with fire, if we are not willing to commit. So, so the brother says to the city, man, must put my life school and sing Zokshat. I'm trying to sister come to Padua town. And O Padua Puma school in, he works. And O sister now, yeah, Puma, she works. First year, sister working, second year, brother working. Ungulungulia Vuma, God allows the brother, Klanganis. And when the brother presents this thing before the sister to say, I, 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 I have gathered some funds God has provided. I want to come. Can they please allow me to be husband over you? The sister says to the brother, no, Mara, not now, my brother. Uh, I'm still young. You know, let me achieve a few things first. Mara, my issue, why date if there is no intention of marriage? If you are too young 
Then why date in the first place? Because you must date mausom dala. Nyege uti dala maujola. Ma when it's time to get married to mnani. Can't do anything. So of course the brother was heartbroken. And he's like, no, it's fine. And he stayed. But all of a sudden the, the relationship just collapsed. And the sister went her way. The brother went his way. And the sister made a wreck of her faith. Of course, some tanas and manj with tabuye. Certain things happened. And she just drifted away from God. And certain things happened. But this is my issue. Why do we flirt with relationship if we are not willing to commit? You'll hear believers say, no, once I'm married, I'll, I think I'll start doing this for the Lord. Heban. Or I think once I'm this age, I'll start doing this for the Lord. No, 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 no. Why therefore are you flirting with the relationship if you're not willing to commit? That in this commitment thing with the Lord, in this faith walk with the Lord, there is no age in which you say, when this age comes upon me, I will commit to the Lord in this way. That when things have gone this way, I'll commit to the Lord to this extent. Why flirt with the relationship if you are not willing to commit, if you are not willing to die to self? No, you know, as soon as I start having a car, I think I'll attend prayers. No, 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 no. You are in a relationship with the Lord. Prayer must be your lifestyle. Why therefore accept him in your heart, but not be willing to go an extent and not willing to walk a mile for his glory and for his purposes. That sometimes we defer certain things for later in life when we are spiritually matured. But Uncle Uncle says, but I thought when you entered into covenant and relationship with me, in that point in time, you were ready to mature in this work. No, I'll lead Bible studies once I'm married. No, I'll lead Sunday school once I have a kid of my own. Why therefore, before you can start working for the Lord? So therefore, you can start working for the Lord. If marriage is what you are waiting for, for you to walk in purpose and for you to lead God's people, then why you oppose Ganani? Because Uncle Uncle says, I want to establish you, I want to work, I want people to come to the faith because of you. So I can't tell God, no, God, give me a wife before I can lead the church. That Lord, once I have a husband, I'll start singing. Ah, uh-uh. then, then why are we in this relationship to begin with? His intentions concerning our lives are clear. Tina, why are we playing games, beating around the bush, playing hard to get with the Lord, playing hard to get with the Lord of the universe? Why are we doing this? Because once we said yes to him, we we must be willing to die for him. We must be willing to serve him without any excuse. No, Yasmina, I I, I don't like standing out. I like to serve. I like to be in a church before I can, I can, I can, I can be an Asha. I'm very shy, so I'm very reserved. So I'm funa bantu bangazi, you know. Maybe after six months in the church, then I'll start saving. I wish I lekai. Then after six months, boy, you save then. Because even though God's intentions have been clearly defined, but we have not defined our intentions. Why? Because maybe we are not intentional in our pursuit and relationship with Him. Maybe we have not sat down and thought about what it means to follow Him. Maybe you have not counted the cost, the lengths in which he has gone for us and thought to ourselves, would we be willing to do the same? Maybe you have not counted the fact that when he gave his son, he did not think twice. But Zalan, we must know this. When the Bible speaks about Jesus in the book of Revelations, and we're going to touch on scriptures, but I want us to consider something. The Bible says in the book of Revelations, Christ was slain before the foundations of the world. Okay, okay, okay. So already Christ in eternity is slain. But now we are told that in the book of Genesis chapter 3, man falls and sin comes to the world. But you see, when sin happens and man falls, God is not surprised nor is God shocked. Why? Because the lamp of God was slain before the foundations of the world. So to show that God was so intentional about us, he made a way for our redemption even before our fall i want you to hear me before our fall god had a redemption plan before our fall god made a plan if that's that that is not intention enough i don't know what is that uncle uncle before isono caesar already he had found a cure to sin it's like someone buying a proposal ring before bamkoma that person is intentional. It's like umuntu asanga nisimali yolobola before mkoma. That person is intentional. It's like a sister buying a wedding dress before 
a brother comes into the picture. That person is intentional. So Unkulunkulu showed us his intention that before sin came to this world, a redemption plan was already finalized, sealed, and ready to go. If that is not intention, I don't know what intention is then. I don't know what intention is then. He was that intentional concerning us being reconciled to him. That even though we were already one with him, before we were separated from him, he already devised a plan that would bring us back to him. A reconciliation plan was already in place. If that is not intention enough, I don't know what intention is. So Uncle Uncle Lubazalani, he's intentional. Before sin this, so God knew that on this day and this date, you and you will be saved and will be reconciled back to me. That's why the Bible often calls us good. At the right time, I the Lord will make it happen. Uncle Uncle does not work with the right time. He works with his time. And his time is always the right time. Christ came at God's time, which made it the right time. Your salvation happened in God's time, which made it the right time. So Uncle Uncle was not shocked when you were still dead in your sins. He already knew that at this point in time, you were going to receive him. And your life was never going to be the same. So he pre-planned and foreknew the day of your salvation. So his intentions concerning you being saved were clear. Oh, Satan tried and come and bring calamity and destruction and distress upon your life. But God has not moved. Why? Because he knew that your life was preserved and kept in his hands. Satan came and tried to attack your family and tried to attack your future and tried to attack take your chastity and try to attack your purity but God was not moved why because he knew that at some point in time you were going to come back to him your life your life was in God's hand all along he was not moved he was not shocked he knew why because he was intentional concerning your salvation zamilu satan waza mukusa waza mukuthu jole waza mukuthu phuze waza mukuthu yenza izinto waza mukuthu ubufile guilty waza mukuthu ufuna ukuzibulala but god knew what your life will not end until the purposes of god have been fulfilled in this life this is god who's intentional we serve an intentional god so we can't blame him on this on his part his intentions are plain ayekho umuntu namhlanje who can say that god's intention concerning us are not plain for all to see that even the unbeliever today is a criminal a murderer unkulunkulu still has not shut the door to receiving them again in his arms that the call of salvation is still echoing and calling them back to a place of redemption in the lord why because god's intentions concerning his people his creation his children are clear and well defined now Let's consider certain scriptures. First John chapter 4, we're going to touch only on verse 19 for the sake of time. And I'm going to be reading from the NLT because I was reading it so John is looking at what it means to love one another as Christ loves us. He's, he's echoing and he's reflecting on this notion which you can't claim to love God who you do not see with your physical eyes, but hate your fellow brother or sister who you can see with your fellow eyes. But this verse is speaking something very profound here. And I want us to reflect on it a bit. And this reveals the intentions of God concerning us. And he says, we love each other because God loved us first. He says, the reason why we know what love looks like is because God is the one who loved us first. So you are serving a God who loved you first. You are serving a God who decided to initiate this relationship. What does John 6 verse 44 say? Jesus says, no one comes to me. He says, no one can come to me unless the father is the one who draws them to me. So Uncle Uncle is the one that initiates this relationship of salvation. And I want you to consider that we are speaking about the God of the universe. Who the Bible says he does not need us in the first place. Who the Bible says even if we do not worship and praise him. He will raise stones to worship him. We are saving a God who created us. We are saving our maker. We are clay in the potter's hands. But still the potter, even though he does not need the clay, the creator, even though he does not need the creation, 
The maker, even though he does not need the making, he still sees the need to be the one who initiates this relationship. That even though we bring nothing to the table, but he's the one who has everything who decides to initiate this relationship. God can still live without us, but we can live without God. But in the midst of all of that, he's the one who still decides to pursue us. So the reason why you are saved today is because God decided to come after you. The reason why I am a child of God today is because God is the one who decided to pursue me. Kabanga, the God of the universe, but I know, man. Let's consider how grandeur and how glorious and powerful he is. He holds the universe together. Maskulmanga, my force of gravity, Nkulunkul is the designer, the maker of all these things. When you speak about the stars, the moon being in their place, God is the one who put these things in place. When we consider the depths of the ocean, when we consider the, the valleys and when we consider the heights of the mountains, when we consider how vast and glorious the universe is, we understand that Nkulunkul is the mind, the maker behind all these things. But still he decides to pursue me. He still decides to come after me. He still decides to be the one that initiates this relationship. Why? Because when it comes to his people, when it comes to his creation, when it comes to his children, God's intentions are always clear. And John says, no, 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 we can't claim to love him because he first loved us. That's why I was touching on this thing with you. You know these these American movies. Powerful glorious abo is in war room. Uh, there's a prayer there where the lady speaks to the Lord and tells the Lord every good thing she's done for the Lord. These movies, man, these Christian movies where you'll find someone shouting at God as the God, I've been faithful. How dare you do this to me? You know, the God of the universe allows those kind of things to slide. And he still pursues us. In our rejection, rebellion, he still pursues us. In our ignorance, he still pursues us. Some of us, before seeing this one, we used to curse the very same God. We're sinful and rebellious and full of rejection, but he still pursued us. The one who can kill us with his wrath, he pursued us. Because we can't claim that anything we've done allowed us and afforded us to be in this place we're in, in this relationship. This relationship, we were, we were received by mercy and grace. Mercy and grace brought us access to this relationship. His wrath didn't, was not kindled upon us. But instead of his wrath, he showed us mercy. He decided to be merciful. So we are bringing that thing to the table. I come to see that we are bringing this relationship. Even your best service does nothing in this relationship. Your giving does nothing to this relationship. It's just an act of honor and appreciation. But it doesn't mean that you are moving anything in eternity. That Unkulunkulumanji must be our slave. That Unkulunkulumanji must hear and take our instructions. No, 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 no. In this relationship, Unkulunkul is the sole provider. He's the sole protector. He's the one who does everything. He goes above and beyond. In this relationship, God is the one who ensures that this relationship continues and is sustainable. He's the sustainer and the maintainer of this relationship. Because that's what the Bible says, every Thing is of the Lord. Silver and gold belong to the Lord. So even when you bring silver and gold to the Lord, think of this. You are bringing things in which God allowed you to have. He's the one that gave these things to you so that you can give it back to him. So I equal to let her in the presence of the Lord. That's why in this relationship, we walk in nothing but gratitude because there's nothing we bring to the table. Because mercy and grace is what afforded us access to this relationship. So when we speak of intentions, when we speak of the person responsible, solely responsible for maintaining and keeping this relationship going, is the Lord Almighty. We spoke on Romans chapter 5 verse 8, which he, Uncle Uncle demonstrated his love for us by this, that even though we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That you have to understand, in the midst of our sins, God is the one that decided to bring Christ to die for us so that we, be, we can be reconciled back to him. Nothing of us, nothing in us wanted anything to do with the Lord. You can see this already from Genesis 11. 
When people wanted to build a tower that reached the heavens, Uti, rebellion was part of our DNA. That the first act of love that we see is that even though we are still in our sins and in our rejection and in our rebellion, Unkulunkulu sent Christ to die for us. He is the one that demonstrated love, perfect love, that even though we are still sinners, living in a place of reject and sinfulness, he sent Christ to die for us. So one thing we can't blame God for is intentions that are not clearly defined. God's intentions concerning us have been clearly defined and outlined. But in King Aingagiti, where in our relationship, in our pursuit, in our fellowship, we are double-minded. We have one foot in the Lord and the other foot in the world. That's why I'm going to say Masanya Malal, because intentions in this relationships in this relationship have not been clearly defined. That's why the church is not found in prayer anymore, because intentions concerning this relationship have not been clearly defined. That's why we make excuses when it's time to fast and pray, because intentions on our side have not been clearly defined. Uncle Uncle does not make excuses when it comes to your breakthrough. Uncle Uncle does not make excuses when it comes to him preserving your life. David speaks with confidence. Why? Because I know that I dwell in safety. Uncle Uncle ensures that I dwell in safety. So do you think when you are sleeping and there are certain spirits and agent, agents in the spiritual realm warring against your life and Uncle Uncle has to build a hedge of covering and protection around you, do you think at that point in time, we have some excuse? We have we have Don't you think there is one greater than you that is watching over your life? When we fail to meet the end of our bargain, the end of our obligation, yeah, nah. He's not constant, constantly and consistently meeting the end of his bargain. Because the God we serve, when he makes a promise, he fulfills it. He does not only make a way, but he carries us through the way. You know, and if it's called so intention for us, fulfilling the end of our bargain, is a difficult thing for a human being. Because we are not wired this way. That's why, Mafunuguyum Sebenz in Gunzim, Mara payday is never difficult because you are wired to always want to receive but not always give. Umuntu has been wired to find joy and glory in a place of reception but not in a place of service. That's why Gumam Nandi Mahola when you receive money from M7 Zinwako. But it's far more difficult for you to fulfill the duties that, is, that have been stipulated in your contract. It's a human thing. But it's said when we see this, even amongst believers. Uti, we love him when he's our rewarder, but neither of us are willing to die, sacrifice our lives, and go an extra mile for his glory and for his purposes. In our relationship with the Lord, we love him, we serve him, we bless him, we honor him, but we are not intentional. No, we are not saying you're not praying, my sister. We're just saying you're not intentional in your purpose. My brother, we're not saying you don't preach good sermons. You are preaching well, but you're not intentional in your pursuit. The issue lies with intention. And I want us to read these two scriptures then stand as well. Second Corinthians chapter 9. And Paul here yeah, is, is going to echo something that I think will be helpful to us. Something that will greatly benefit us. Something that will greatly mature us in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 5. The context of this verse or chapter, or Paul speaks about the believers in Corinth. And when he speaks to the believers in Corinth, I know there are certain gifts in which you want to give the church of Jerusalem. Because the, Je the church of Jerusalem was experiencing some kind of famine. There were issues and struggles in the church. And Paul says, look, I know you've committed to help the church. And in fact, because of your commitment, even the church of Macedonia has even committed to give also to the church of Jerusalem. So Uti, so that I do not become embarrassed and you too may not be embarrassed. Uti, I'm going to send fellow brethren to come and confirm Uti Gashe Gashe. The whole thing of you giving to the church of Jerusalem still stands. But I want us to learn something from what he says. I want us to draw certain principles from what he's saying in chapter five, in verse five. He says, so I thought I should send these brothers ahead of me to make sure the gift you promised is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. 
So he's speaking on something else, and, and I want us to refocus this to intention. Our intentions with the Lord must be clear. First thing that Paul is trying to speak to the church, when you honor this promise, I want you to honor it from a place of willingness and not from a place where you are holding a grudge. That our intention concerning the Lord, our intention concerning serving the purposes and the kingdom of the Lord must be done from a place of willingness and not from a place where we hold grudges in our service. That after you serve the Lord and you say yes to his truth and you say yes to his word, after you receive him and you receive his instructions, you fulfilling his instructions and commandments must be done from a place of willingness, not from a place of a grudge. That's why Banya Bantu, in their service for God, they desire applause. They desire acknowledgement. Why? Because there's no aspect of willingness. There's an aspect of being seen. And as a result, if they don't receive applause from us, you're doing well, and they don't receive the pat in the back, they are now coming to a place, or they come to a place where their service is mixed with forms of grudge, where their service to the Lord is not from a place of willingness anymore, in the absence of human applause, is done from a place of being done grudgingly. So Paul Ruti, in your service, in your giving, and you fulfilling the very same promise you made unto the church of Jerusalem, I pray, my brothers, that you do this from a willful spirit and not grudgingly. Don't count the things, the sacrifices, is in those for the sake of his kingdom. Because the moment you start to count, but God, I was faithful. God, I kept myself. God, I did not go here. God, when my friends were doing this, I did not do this. Uncle Uncle says, from that moment in time, I am realizing what your service did not come from a place of willingness, but it came grudgingly. That in our intentions being clear, our intentions must be backed and accompanied by willingness. And he says this, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who, who plants generously will get generous crop. Therefore, you must each decide in your heart. And I want us to focus on this. See, as Utini, but there's something he says, Uti, before you still fulfill this promise you made concerning the church of Jerusalem, I want each of you to decide in your heart. And this is what I want to say to you tonight, Uti, in your pursuit, in your service, Decide in your heart. Make your intentions clear. From now on, I will serve you from a place of truth and honor. Each must decide in their heart concerning their service to the Lord. You must make a decision. You must make a decision. How do you want your work to play out? Each must decide how they will serve the Lord. In making a vow, each must decide on the vow they will make unto the Lord. Don't do this for the sake of us. Don't do this to be seen by men, to be applauded by men. Because Paul says, the moment I live my life and serve the Lord for the sake of getting human approval, he says, at that moment in time, I stand a chance of being disqualified from being a born servant of Christ. So don't do it for us. Each must decide in their heart how they will serve the Lord. Your intentions must be clear in the absence of people. Paul says, no, no, no. Each must decide in their heart how much they will give. And in giving, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Our relationship with the Lord stems from a place of pressure. Our full worship team, you are just pressurized to sing in the worship team. You don't want to be an usher in your church. Your heart doesn't want you to be an usher. You are pressurized to be an usher. You're just feeling the pressure with the team. So Paul says, no, 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 in serving the Lord, in doing anything for the Lord, each must decide in their heart and not do anything in a, from a place of reluctance. Because once you become reluctant, then your intentions are not pure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. God loves a person who serves him cheerfully. Last scripture I want us to touch on. The devil is a liar. I'm not going to blame the devil. Luke 14, I want us to close with the scripture. Jesus speaks about the cost of following Christ. And he's outlaying something very powerful and something very profound here. Something that I think it will help us to pay mind and attention to. He says, who of you can build 
without counting the cost first. Uti, which men can lay a foundation, intending in their heart to build, but in laying the foundation and in their intention to build, they have not counted the cost. Uti, for that man will bring nothing but shame upon themselves and stands a chance of being mocked and laughed by others because they might find themselves building but not being able to finish. Why? Simple thing, they did not count the cost. And he says, in following me, I would like to advise you, count the cost. The reason why Ujeso had seasons where 5,000 were following him and 5,000 were 72 and 72 were 12 and 12 were 11. And when he's crucified, the 11 are not the only John is there. It's because there were issues with them counting the cost. Every single time they realized the cost, they walked away from him. Abanye Betu, our inconsistent service and our lack of service and commitment to the Lord stems from a place where we have not counted the cost. We have not counted the cost of what it truly means to be a follower of Christ. We have not counted the cost of what it means to be in relationship with him. We have not counted the cost of what it means to be a follower of Christ, which we must deny ourselves daily. That we must die daily. That we must carry our crosses daily. That we must put the members of our flesh to death daily. We have not counted the cost. So the inconsistency comes and stems from a place where you have not counted the cost. I go to Tandi is because you have not counted the cost. I go to you have an issue with not attending prayer services because you have not counted the cost of being a follower and a believer. That's why prayer meetings sound like an inconvenience. The whole night. Why? Because you've not counted the cost. That's why I'm a Saturday service is poor. Because when I'm a Saturday, you want to chill with your friends and catch up because you've not counted the cost. That's why Umfundisi must preach for 30 minutes and be done so that you can go home and enjoy your Sunday because you've not counted the cost. So the inconvenience in your work the inconsistencies in your work stem from a place where you've not counted the cost of what it means to be a follower, a true follower of Christ who needs to put themselves to death daily, deny themselves daily. I listen to nothing as fast every week. I listen to now and then deliverance, deliverance. I listen to nothing mal every day. You have not counted the cost. Now I have a lot of tenders every day. You have not counted the cost. That in relationship with him, both parties must be willing to pay the cost. Both parties must be willing to pay the price. And guess what? He has paid the cost here. He has paid the price here. When or what are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of the betterment, purity, and pleasure of this relationship? Gumnandi and Ufile for his to but Tina were not willing to die. Gumnandi and he paid the cost so that we can be reconciled to him. But Tina were not willing to pay the price to ensure that we remain in this reconciliation. Why must Christ be the only one that suffers? But Tina, in this salvation, we enjoy the pleasures of this life. Why must we expect him to lay his life for us? But Tina, we're not willing to lay our lives for him. Why must we expect him to love us, but we're not willing to love him? And only those who love me obey my commandments. Why? Because we are not intentional. We have not counted the cost. And I'm trying to the premise of, of why I want us to discuss these things. The premise of why I want us to talk on these things is that, Lord, realign our focus. Realign our perspective. Help us clarify our intentions so that our intentions may be aligned to yours and that we may be one with you in this relationship. With double-mindedness, with plan Bs and plan Cs. He is committed to us, but Tina, we have not fully committed to him. That's why it's called the husband meant to the church. That's why the salvation thing is compared to marriage. It's a covenant thing. He has fulfilled the end of his covenant. Tina, slogos ya chita, slogos na manga, slogos ya ngena ya puma, astolagali, ya slalekaya, sikona, siko. We are inconsistent. We are unfaithful. But because faithfulness is who he is, he still remains. Because he is faithful. Even though we are not faithful, he will, he will remain. Uncle Uncle, when he makes a covenant, he never breaks the covenant. You can check through all the covenants in the Bible. He never broke a covenant. Men were always the ones who broke the covenant. He commits to us. He loves us. He pursues us. But Tina, we're not willing to do the same. So the, so the prayer should be, Lord, help us realign our intentions to yours. Help us clarify our intentions 
but most importantly, teach us faithfulness. That's why faithfulness is a, is a fruit of the Spirit. Oktembagala is a fruit of the Spirit. Yenya tembagala njalo, but Tina, we have an issue of commitment. We have commitment issues to the Lord. It's easy to look at someone who cheats on their wife and say, this person is unfaithful to their wife. It's easy to see someone who's unfaithful to their girlfriend or boyfriend and ridicule them. But Tina, on a daily basis, we are unfaithful to the one who has called us to partnership and marriage and our salvation and in the covenant of salvation. Now, I'm just corner, Sasa Siko. 11 months of the year's corner, I'm shut in. What December say, Malala? Why? Because our intentions are not clear. We have not counted the cost of what it means to be a follower. The, the cost, your son. I always say this it's easy to come to him, but the greatest challenge many believers will have is to remain in him. That's why, as people are married, the challenge is not the marriage itself. The challenge is when you are faced with having to be faithful in marriage. That's where the real challenge starts. So Tina, we are in that phase where we are not, we are found wanting, we are not trustworthy. We cannot be trusted in this covenant with him. When he calls us, when he wants to spend time with us, when he wants to fix issues with us, when he wants to mature us, when he wants to fix us, when he, when he wants fellowship and communion and fellowship with us, relationship, proximity with us, we are not where to be found. Why? Because we have not counted the cost of what it means to be in this relationship with him. We have not made our intentions clear, even though his intentions have been clear from day one. May we, may we stay in him. May we remain in him. May we be joined to him. May we be faithful to him. May we be trustworthy to him. And I always say this, and we're going to pray. We, we sometimes think, Uti, our relationship with God is disconnected to our relationship with everyone else. And let me tell you something. If I have faithfulness issues with the Lord, chances are this spirit of unfaithfulness might bleed in every area of my life. I want you to hear me carefully. If I have an attitude of unfaithfulness to the Lord, chances are this spirit and attitude of unfaithfulness might bleed to other parts of my life, other relationships in my life. And the same way, if I struggle to be faithful to my wife, faithful to the house of God, faithful to the commitments I make with fellow brethren and people in my life, chances are that might also be seen in my relationship with the Lord. Because your fellowship with the Lord often gives us an indication of your fellowship with God's people. And your fellowship with God's people often gives us an indication of your fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So sometimes, no, 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 no. This is why in your life, you find yourself struggling with faithfulness is because you were not faithful to him in the first place. You never allowed him to train the spirit of faithfulness in you. Why can't I keep a relationship? Why am I inconsistent? Why am I always church hopping? It's because you have faithfulness issues. You have trustworthiness issues. You have consistency issues that started in the spirit. And you are wondering why are these things bleeding out to your physical life? It's because you never paid mind to these things. That's why I always say this. When Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, let me tell you something. If you don't understand earthly principles, how therefore can you understand heavenly principles? Because these, the, these things are joined. These things are one. That's why Uncle Uncle gave us physical fathers so that we can understand how physical fathers are so that we can connect to him as a spiritual father. Or oh, to all fathers are protective. Fathers are caring. Fathers are providers. So that when we see him as a provider, as a protector, we understand him. Why? Because he allowed us to be exposed to these principles from an earthly realm, from an earthly perspective. So sometimes we think these things are disconnected. No, they are not. No, they are not. Check certain things in your life that you struggle with. It's because you have not fully surrendered them to the Lord and these things have always been struggles in the spirit. And I want us to pray. I want us to take two minutes, three minutes to pray. I want you to talk to the Lord. I know this is live. I know this is happening on social media, but we know Wutungulungul is powerful and he's able. He's sovereign at the end of the day, so he can't be confined by anything. I want you to pray and to be intentional with the Lord and, and, and to be specific with the Lord. In these areas of my life, I've not been intentional. I mean, what, what else can I do? I've not been intentional with it. I would have received a word specifically for me in this season. 
Yes, we be expectant just in intercession. You figure something about intercession. You figure up on the ulambile, hungry for the Lord, thirsty for the Lord, longing for the Lord. You figure with this great expectation, which I'm challenging in this intercession, Uncle Uncle is gonna move. So say, say, Lord, can you awake again, revoke, bring to life again certain appetites for you? An appetite for your weight. When I engage in your weight, near in your weight with expectation. When I go in these live streams, near Lapo with great expectation. I want you to pray that, Lord, maybe there's a level of hunger that has died in you. A longing that you used to have for the Lord that has died in you. Say, Lord, bring these things back, man. The hunger for you. The hunger for righteousness. The thirst. The thirst for righteousness. The longing for your face. The longing for your presence. Bring these things back to me so that I can be intentional in my pursuit and in my service to you. Pray, be intentional. You are alone in a private space. You're muted, so be intentional with God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, O oh God, for pressing our hearts, Lord, to this extent where you desire us to come to a place where we are truly conformed to the pattern and to the image of your son. Lord, you, 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 you love us so much. You care for us so, so much that while we were still sinners in the place of rejection, Christ died for us. That you foreknew and you predestined us, O oh God, to salvation. And you called us, O oh God, to a place of fellowship with your presence. You knew our names before the foundations of the world, that in Amsanje, our names would have been written in the book of life. We too will be called the redeemed of the Lord. You saved us, O oh God, even though we did not deserve to be saved in the first place. And Lord, we, we come with great humility and shame before your presence and repenting, O oh Lord, saying, O oh Lord, forgive us for every single time we've not been intentional in our pursuit. Every single time we've not been intentional in our relationship with you. Every single time we've not been intentional in our fellowship. Lord, we are praying that make us again. Strengthen us, O oh God. Build us up again. That let there be a hunger that is awakened, a thirst, a longing for the face of the Lord. That may we be expectant again. David says, I wake up in the morning and I make my prayers unto the Lord and I wait the entire day with great expectation that the Lord will move on my behalf. May expectations abound in our hearts. May hope abound in our hearts. May faith arise, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, that we will have faith that you will answer our prayers. We will have faith that you'll preserve us. You'll make us holy and righteous. You'll teach us faithfulness and self-control. In areas of sin, in areas of weakness, in areas where we have not walked in complete faithfulness before the Lord, we know that you'll restore us back again. You'll reconcile us back again and you'll make us again. Receive the prayers of my sisters and brothers in this time. Receive the prayers of the saints this evening. Heed on our behalf, O oh God. Receive us, O oh God. Consider our anguish consider our distresses oh lord for david says i i made my distresses and my anguish known unto the lord and he heard my prayers receive our anguish receive our distresses receive our anxious thoughts receive the question marks receive our fears receive our uncertainties oh god and strengthen our hearts give boldness to our hearts make us again so that when it's all said and done we can be with you for all eternity align our work mature our growth and forgive our sins. We know you to be a loving, merciful, and gracious God because that is who you are. Unchanging, unfailing, steadfast, long-suffering, enduring in your love. That is who you are. And we bless you for your ways. There's none like you, none besides you are God alone. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Um, as always, thank you so much for coming through. Um, I hope God spoke to you. I hope this was helpful to you. I hope this is helping you in your walk. This is reviving your heart. This is reviving your faith. I know it's doing to. I know it's doing that to to my faith. I know it's doing that to my heart. Um, every single time I come here and meet you guys, I, I feel closer to God every single time because there's so many things in Kulungula's Vezayo. I'm not just speaking to you guys, I'm also speaking to myself through these reflections and through these conversations. And I feel more closer and closer to God every single time and aligning me and rechanneling me and bringing certain things to light and maturing me. And I hope it's the same with you. Um, so we, we don't do these lives every day. So we do these live streams every Monday and every Tuesday 
at 9 p.m. So we have a group. Um, this is where we communicate everything. This is where we communicate if there are any things in between. And should there be a day when we decide to go live on a random day, I'll let you guys know. If there's a day where there is a physical meeting that happens or something that happens, or even, it's, even if it's virtual, I'll let you guys know. So if you're not part of that goal, please send me a DM. Send Osis Lindo, Osis Pudens, um, Osis Clio a DM so that we can add you guys to the group. And then you guys can be just updated of any communications that happen. But we meet on Mondays and Tuesdays at 9 p.m. every single week. God willingly, of course.